Inflation is a, obviously a very confusing term. It is a term that uh, historically and in the Austrian economics literature basically refers to the printing of money. It refers to monetary inflation. That is uh, printing, printing money in excess uh, in, a, in a fiat money context in excess of productivity growth. Right? In excess of productivity growth. So now you have more money chasing a fixed number of goods. But uh, any, uh, you know, they don't even mention the productivity growth. Any additional money that is increased, that's inflation. Inflation can be high, it can be low, but that is inflation. But in regular usage, and in particular, in the, but including in the usage of mainstream economists and mainstream politicians and pretty much everybody, inflation has come to mean Price inflation, that is the idea that prices as a basket and the basket of goods can be differently defined and, and the Federal Reserve itself has five different measures of inflation, at least. That this basket of goods, the, 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 the basket of goods that either we as consumers pay for or businesses pay for, that prices overall, on average, are going up. That is, uh, that is the, um, you know, that is the new uh, and popular and common and prevalent definition of inflation. Now, it is true that prices can go up for short periods of time because of supply side shocks. But only some prices, the ones that have the supply side shock, are going to go up. But if the amount of money that people have in order to demand goods doesn't change, the overall basket of goods does not go up. Now, you know, if, if, if this shock happens to the particular items that are heavily weighted in this basket, then yes, those prices will go up. But inflation, as understood as a generalized increase in prices, will not go up. And even in the items where the supply shock has happened, will go up temporarily as, as uh, uh, providers of the stuff ramp up production and increase the supply and prices will come back down. And in supply side shocks, what happens is Price, the, the, the prices that go up, go up. And then once new products come into the market, they then go down. They, it's not that inflation just goes down in terms of how high it is. Prices literally go down. And you can see that with oil. If, if you have uh, some kind of shock, let's say a war breaks out in the Middle East and uh, tankers can't reach their ports, fewer, fewer, there's less oil in, in the world supply, then uh, the, the, the oil prices will go up globally. As soon as, let's say, the war's over, or we find alternative, uh, alternative uh, sources of oil uh, that floods the market, the price will come down to where it was before. So it's up and down, the price. But once you increase the supply of money in the economy, that is the demand side. You never shrink it. So prices will go up, and then when inflation stops, they will stay at the new level. And when you increase the supply of money, that supply of money can go into particular industries. It can go into particular places, be invested in particular places, and you'll see prices go up locally in particular industries, like in the 2000s, real estate prices went up, partially because the Fed lowered interest rates and th there was more money, but also because the federal government funneled the money, if you will, into housing. It incentivized everybody to take a mortgage and to buy a house. But that wasn't an overall rise in the price of goods, and therefore 
people didn't consider that inflation. What happened during COVID is that the government basically, through the Fed, printed money and sent checks to people. So they didn't favor any particular industry over another. The money didn't enter in any particular way or another, but it was given to consumers. And then we had, so we had more money, and therefore we went out and demanded goods. Now, that also coincided with the supply shock. So that had the opportunity to raise prices in a combination of the two things. The supply shock is long gone, but the reality is the extra money that has entered into the system and is still circulating is still there. And that's why inflation continues at a, at a lower level. But prices haven't come down and they never will come down. Now, I will say, and I showed you this, I, I, I talked about this yesterday, I think, the Federal Reserve has shrunk its, uh, its, uh, its balance sheet. So it has taken some money out of circulation in the U.S. It has taken some money out of circulation. You can look at an M2 chart and you can see M2 coming down over the last, uh, over the, over the last couple of years. It went down and then it's flat over the last few months. But, yeah, it's still not, the amount of money is still nowhere near where it was before COVID. It's still higher than COVID. You can see that with M2. M2 is still higher than where it was before the stimulus. So you'd expect prices to stabilize at a significant higher level than they were before COVID. And even if inflation goes to zero, they'll stay at that new level, a higher level. No, M2 literally has gone down. And M2 has gone down because, not the rate of change, it's literally gone down. It's gone down because of the way M2 is measured, but because basically the Fed has been selling bonds. So when the Fed sell bonds, it's you get a piece of paper and the Fed gets, quote, money that it in a sense burns. So you actually shrink bank reserves because money's going out of the economy, and that's M2 actually shrinking. Um, let's see. Uh, ta -ta 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 -tum. Let's see if I can get you a... Graph. Uh, so we can shrink the time frame. This is not rate of change. This is actually M2. Let's see if I can share this uh, with you. Uh, yeah, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, let's do this. Um, Let's, let me share this with you so uh, you can see the, um, the M2, where is M2, St. Louis Fed. Okay, yeah, there you go. You guys can see that, right? Uh, so what you can see is that M2 goes through the roof under Trump in, in the COVID year, the first year, continues to go up during Biden, and then declines. That's the Fed unwinding the balance sheet. Now, because of the scale, the unwinding doesn't look that big, but if you only look at the last 10 years, that's a big decline in M2. And that's why inflation has not continued. Right? This is not M2 velocity, this is M2. Uh, let's see if you go to 10 years. Let's do it. Yep, you can see that starting in April 18th, 2022, the Fed started uh, reducing its balance sheet. Yep. And if you see the last five years, you can see, again, M2 peaks 
on Monday, April 18th, 2022. And this, the increase, the increase in um, starts in March 2nd, 2022, and just skyrockets, and that's all Trump. That's all Trump. It, it, it goes all the way. I mean, it, it again, it, it, it's, uh, when is the election? The election's November, is halfway through the growth. So half of the growth is Trump and half of the growth is Biden. That's why this inflation is half Trump, half Biden. Yeah, I mean, I said, bump, I mean, the, the, the first big increase of M2 is Trump. So Trump caused at least half of the growth in the money supply, at least, uh, the, of, of, uh, of the M2 money supply. And now, you know, I, I'm not, the correlation between M2 and inflation Aim to growth. Uh, if we go back to Max, um, you can't see the 70s uh, back here, but here inflation was very high. We can't see the M2 growth that preceded that. Uh, but look at that growth, and relative to that growth in M2, inflation has been pretty timid. You'd expect a much higher inflation given how much they increase M2 by. So it's not, there's no equation. It translates the growth of M2 into, um, into uh, inflation. Complicated topic. And yeah, we could, we could easily do a whole show on, um, on inflation and, uh, and, and talk about inflation in greater detail. Um, yep. All right, let's see. All right, so that is the platform inflation. I don't think I had anything else I wanted to say about inflation. Uh, I, I, I was surprised that I put up on Twitter the fact that inflation is caused by the Fed and by government deficits. And I got this huge backlash, huge backlash. Um, and... Uh, and the relationship between raising interest rates and inflation is in question. It's not obvious. Um, John Cochran, who I, I, is one of my favorite economists out there in the world, believes that high interest rates ultimately lead to higher inflation. Now, again, it depends on a lot of other factors. Depends on a lot of other factors. Uh, one of those factors, let's, let's talk about this, because we talked a lot about this economic stuff. Let's talk about, where is that chart? Yeah, let's talk about this, because this is one of the interesting things, is the Trump, the Trump, uh, whoops, why did that go all out of whack? Huh. Uh, the Trump platform does not talk about this. Right? This is the federal budget, 1960 to 2054. Projections, of course. 20 uh, uh, to uh, let's grow this a little bit so you guys can see it a little bit better center it right there it is and uh, you know and this this is relates to that section in Trump's platform that says we're going to protect seniors if you look here at uh, the, the the budget right now right if you look if you look at at, at 1960 Basically, the federal government budget was dominated by what it should be dominated by, which is defense. Defense dominated. And then there was non-defense discretionary, but it wasn't that, you know, it wasn't a huge amount. And then there was other entitlements. It was relatively small. This was before the war on poverty. And then there was Social Security and, and uh, health entitlements. Not big at all because, I mean, we didn't have a large elderly population. And then interest on the debt was very small because there was very little debt. Interest rates were, very, were high, relatively speaking, although they, they were low. They were lower than they are today, but not as low as they were in the 2010s. But uh, interest was low because there was just not that much debt. Even though just a few years, a couple of days, 15 years earlier, we'd come out of World War II. Now look at today. Defense is tiny as a total of the federal budget, right? It's, it's small, right? That's the orange. And 
it, it's it's expected to stay at around three percent. Non-defense discretionary is also not that big. There's not a lot of money the government spends on non-defense discretionary in terms of the percentage that it spends. Other entitlements skyrocketed during COVID, but have come back to where they were before. So welfare programs, uh, war and poverty, all of that. Yeah, we spent about 2.6% of the budget on that. 3% on non-defense discretionary, 3% on discretionary. Now, uh, this is percent of GDP, sorry, 3% of GDP. So while these look flat, in, real ter- in, in dollar terms, these are all growing because GDP is growing, right? So take that into account. It's not that we're spending the same num- amount of dollars. It's that we're sen- spending the same percentage of GDP. But look at Social Security and Medicaid. I mean, look at those numbers. Basically, we're heading towards 14.3% of GDP. And this is assuming GDP grows because Social Security and health entitlements in terms of the dollars are going to grow even if we enter a recession and GDP, GDP is negative. And then look at net interest. And look at that net interest just before COVID. And look at that interest today. Basically, we are going to be paying for all the debt we took on during COVID, for all the borrowing the government did during COVID to fund all that stimulus. And we are going to be paying for all the debt the government is taking on in order to fund Social Security and Medicaid. We and our kids and our grandkids are going to be paying that for years and already are paying it right now. I mean, this is just an astounding graph. And now, what, if anything, did Trump, this Trump's platform or the Democrats platform do about any of this? Zero, nothing, nada doesn't do anything here. It doesn't reduce debt, so it doesn't reduce net interest. It claims you will lower interest by lowering inflation, but that's just voodoo. He doesn't tell us how, and it's not up to him. It's up to the Fed. He's not going to touch the security of Medicaid. He's told us over and over again. They're going to defend them. They're going to protect them. So they're going to cut waste. That's a non-defense discretionary. They're going to cut waste and non-defense discretionary. That has no impact on the bigger picture. You can eliminate all non-defense discretionary, and it doesn't have that big of an impact. It just, it's just insanity. And yet, Republicans who used to claim they cared, I don't think they ever really cared, but they used to claim they cared, don't care one iota. Don't care one iota, and they don't want to be honest with the American people about what it's going to take and what's actually involved and why this is important.